Eu já sou entrar lá. Não, vamos para a gente ter um dia e hopefully show up this morning with a with a purpose to to get closer to the Lord personally, uh, not to not to come for for any other reason than that. So this morning uh, in worship here, let's uh, let's do our best to to focus on getting intimate with the Father. So let's stand up and pray. Hey. Wish you, wish. 
Teaching to him, he loves to reveal himself. Amen. And you know, and I believe that that is a huge, huge thing that we've got to, to recognize. And so 
I know on my travels, I, I heard a few things going down there. I will share some of that with you. There's some of it I won't be sharing with you today. But uh, I got to thinking about scripture and the word of God and how some of the things are and what what is the Lord trying to tell me in it because I honestly I probably don't read as much of just the word that I should and I probably don't pray as much as I should now the word teaches us that we are to pray without ceasing and you know and that's one of those things that you know I believe I, we we have an opportunity to live our lives as a prayer yes, in, in open communication with our Heavenly Father. And so whenever I say a prayer life, many times people get to thinking about something like this. And you know, and, it's, and, and I believe instead of this, I believe it's more this, of just totally surrendering ourselves to hear from the Father. And so when I, when I get to, as I share some of that with you today, Hopefully that some more of this will be revealed to you. But I got to looking back into the book of Hebrews. Because you know it talks of, of Hebrews, it talks about, uh, it's called the Hall of Faith. Mm -hmm. You know, and it talks about so many different, so the, the ones that have gone on before us. And you know, and I know even in some translation it calls it the power of bold faith. You know, God created us to have a bold faith. Actually a faith that comes through His Son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what he died to give us. But he also died to usher in his kingdom into every aspect of our lives. And so in that, I know that I need to walk by faith. See, the word talks here in this book of Hebrews, it starts out and says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed and that God commanded so that what was seen was not made out of what was visible. He, he took, well, through his word, he can take something that seems impossible and make it possible that's right. within your lives. And so that's just what one of the things that, that these ancients were known for. And it said, that, it said, by faith, Abel, by faith, Enoch. And it said, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who what? earnestly or diligently seek him. You know what? You're doing it on purpose. And when we are intentionally, man, there's a lot of good words right there. When we are intentionally seeking him, he made us a promise. And you know what it was? That we would find him. He would give us the revelation that we need in that. So, it goes on and says, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Isaac, by faith Jacob, by faith Sarah, by faith Joseph, by faith Moses, by faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on to dry land. By faith the walls of Jericho fell. By faith the prostitute Rahab. By faith Gideon. By faith Barak. By faith uh, Samson. By faith it just goes on and on. By faith, believe in what God's word says. Believe in what the Lord is telling them. Believe in the revelation that they know comes from the throne of God into their individual lives. Now we can see that it happened in, in to so many different ones, but it goes on in, in the verse 39 over here of Hebrews 11. It says, they were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what was promised. What was promised? It was love. And it says, God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. You know what? God has given us something that they were reaching out for. Something that they had been promised God chose us to receive that, that they too could be made perfect with us. You said, well, Donald, I know you and you ain't been made perfect. Well, you're looking at the flesh. And you know what? Many times I act out in the flesh. But the Word teaches us that we, as born-again believers, become spiritual. And when we recognize that within our life, 
That spirit that now lives within us has been made perfect. Amen. It's always been perfect because it is the spirit of God that lives and dwells within you as his children, as the children of God. And so I see some of these things and I'm going, you know, I, I know that God has so much for me in this. So let, let me just keep this going just a minute. And it says, my phone's going off. It says, God planned something better for us so that together with us, they would be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, you know what? We're in the family of God. Amen. And when we recognize, it's not only talking about you and I, it's talking about Abraham. It's talking about Joseph. It's talking about Isaac. It's talking about this is our family. That there's a, there's a generational blessing of them to be able to walk in the faith. The faith, which is what? The truth. That's a key word that we're going to look at. We'll go and it said, that we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin. Now, what is the definition of sin? It just simply is missing the mark. You ever miss the mark? I'm not just talking about today. I'm talking. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. I'm going to move on. And it said, and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. One of the things that the Lord asked me, or that the Lord was revealing to me in my travels this week, was uh, who or what is leading your race? And it sort of caught me off guard a little bit. And so who or what is leading your race? And I begin to think about, I'm, take, I'm taking a big road trip and I've got several things that I need to get done. And I need the wisdom and the revelation that comes from God to see it accomplished while I'm there in a short time. And I saw some amazing things happen. I got a whole lot more done than what I was anticipating on getting done. So I know that the Lord was directing me in some of these things to even go because we had other things going on that I needed to be here for, but I'm going, I got to go. And it's just one of those unctions or however you want to say it within you that you said, you need to go now. And, and I'm glad, so glad I did. But it goes on and says, so let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Who's the author of your race? The perfecter of your race? The perfecter of your faith? Am I running Donald Hill's race? Or am I running the Lord's race? We can, I can go with a lot. I'm just throwing it out there. And it said, Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggles against missing the mark, against sin, <clears throat> you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood and you have forgotten that the word, the word of encouragement has addressed you as sons. Hey, what that song would you say a minute ago? I am a child of God. I am who he says I am. Amen. You know what? There's, I know that I am a child of God now before I am a heel. Mm -hmm. I am more a child of God than I am a heel. Now that may sound strange to some, and, and I don't, I'm not here just to mess up your theology of things, but I am here to reveal truth in our lives. The word teaches us that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he said, there's going to be something that happens when you do that. Now, you know what? I can search out the things of the hills, and some of it's not going to look so good. But that was my brother, not me. <laughs> but, but, 
Don't y'all say anything. Either. <laughs> but there's, there's so much. We need to know what is the race that we're running? What are we doing in this life? What is our purpose in this life? He, he revealed it to us so plainly when we learn to look at it from a kingdom point of view. Now it goes, this word, it goes on so much we can look at it, it says, and I want to read this scripture to you, a different translation. This is out of the, the Passion Translation of Hebrews 12, 28. And it says, since we are receiving our rights to an unshakable kingdom, our rights. What does that mean? Who has the right to an unshakable kingdom except the children of God? That's, right. That's us. So it, it is our right to see the advancement of the kingdom not only in our lives, but to take that and what he's entrusted to do us to impart it into the lives of others wherever we go and whatever we're doing. The word teaches us, it says that we're receiving this uh, kingdom that cannot be shaken. I mean, you know that we live in a pretty shook up world. Mm -hmm. But that's not who we are. That doesn't give us our definition. And it says, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. You know what that means? It means that he's a, he is the light of the world. And he said, I'm putting that light into you, my children, and now you are the light of the world. Hey, that fire that started within us when we said yes to Jesus will get bigger. If you want it to. If you want it to. Okay. Now, what, what do you need to run the race that God has marked out for you? What do you need? You know, that's one of the things that I began to, to look at because I'm, I'm going to reveal three things that the Lord revealed to me as, as I went uh, on this little trip. And the first one that I know that I need to run the race that God marked out for me is truth. And you know what? I found out that there's only one place to receive truth. Because I don't know if y'all have ever noticed this, but mankind will lie to you about things. And I have said, and I've listened to some teachings before, and I'm going, that's not what this says. Maybe you've seen that, maybe you haven't. But I'm not here to judge somebody else's teaching even today. But I am here to reveal truth. Because I know that the Word teaches me that truth will set you free. And I know that Jesus Christ, he said, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. There's some key words in that, set. In other words, put you in an entirely different position. He set you someplace new. And that place is where the Father first originated for you to be. And that's in this kingdom that he desires to continue to establish on the face of this earth. And so what do I need? First of all, it's truth. The next one, the three words, let me just throw it out this way. Truth, transformation, and travel. He said, well, Tom, he was traveling down the road, so that was a word, travel. No, he gave me revelation in that. And that's what I want to share part of that here with you today. But the, the truth, you know, the truth sets you free. Transformation, it changes things. I can tell you this. If you are a child of God, you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you've never had any transformation in your life, you need to go back to the drawing board. That's right, amen. You need to go back to, to the Father himself and say, Lord, tell me who I am. Because he said, if you come to him, he said he's going to show you. That's right, amen. And so transformation is a key thing. And you know what? Transformation not only changes my heart, it changes my mind, it changes my response to life and the situations that we face. And then the travel. The travel. The best way sometimes I can explain something is through 
the Lord's word himself. And so in Matthew 11, 12, I thought I marked that, but I didn't. In Matthew eleven twelve, it says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God had been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. So you know what? If something is forcefully advancing, what's it doing? It's traveling forward. If you're part of the kingdom of God, you're always going to be going forward. Because God never backs up. He's always going to be going forward. So if I'm going to go with him and run the race that he had marked out for me, I know that I'm going forward. I remember several years ago in some studies that we were doing, Sondra came to me with a scripture that just boom, exploded within her. And as she took what she had received and imparted that into me, and I mean, I've never forgot, it's Hebrews uh, 10, 39, I believe, where it says that we are not of those that shrink back and are destroyed, but those that believe and are saved go forward. That's who God created us to be, vessels going forward with the advancement of the kingdom of God. John 10, 10, how many of you can quote that? Most, probably everybody in here, John 10, 10, it says what? There's a thief that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I, Jesus, came that you may have life and life to the fullest. Amen. You know what's part of that's true? Oh. The whole thing is. The whole thing is. Yes, there's an enemy that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. What am I saying? There's an enemy that does not want you to enter in to a kingdom of prayer life. There's an enemy that does not want you to get intimate with the Heavenly Father. There's an enemy that wants to bring distractions into your life. You know, many times whenever I'm traveling, even going to the range and stuff, I'll have something on my mind and be thinking and trying to pray and stuff. But have you ever noticed that in your prayer lives that you can just be praying about something and then you think about something and you're off over here? <laughs> Or you're, so I'm not alone. Okay, okay. This is the right group. So, <laughs> I shared with some of you last week about who I believe is the biggest enemy for the advancement of the kingdom of God. And I believe the biggest enemy in three phases, the biggest enemy for the advancement of the kingdom of God within your life, first of all, is your selfishness. I can tell you these things and stand up here and tell them to you boldly because these have been convictions within my life. The second one is ignorance. And I got to think, man, you know, maybe I shouldn't use that word ignorance. And then maybe I ought to do something like, you know, instead of ignorance, maybe I could say misunderstood. And then I got to saying, Satan, get behind me. I am not standing here to be politically correct. Because I believe ignorance, not knowing, is one of the biggest enemies that Satan uses to keep you from being who God created you to be. The third one, I told you I wasn't here to mess with your theology, but this one, my little bit, is religion. God didn't create us. I shared with folks here uh, a few months ago, actually. I, got, I went to looking up the religions of the world and all this, and you know what? Christianity is listed right in the middle of it. And I got through that, I got to thinking, I'm going, it's just, it's not listed as being any different than Muslim, than Judaism, than any other thing. Islamic, it's in the same list. And I'm going, Lord, what are you showing me here? What are you trying to tell me? And I believe that one of the things that he was showing me is that Jesus came not to be a religious leader, 
But he came to usher in his father's kingdom. Amen. And he wants you to grab a hold of that kingdom and forcefully advance with him. From the very beginning in the book of Genesis, it talks about how God created us male and female to have dominion on this world, to be in control to do it. And you know what? Who's controlling your race? Who's controlling the race that you're running? I look at these things and I, I know that God has his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways are higher than my way. In fact, I think Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. And if you seek it out, you will find it. Because your life is hidden within Christ himself. Amen. And so, as I look at this, I say, yeah, this religion, a definition would be a false substitute for the real kingdom. Okay? You know, Satan's no problem for God. Satan's not the opposite of God. Satan is a deceiver. And he wants to he wants to bring deception. When man first ran into him, what did he look like? He was a serpent. And when you begin to look at it and you read what Jesus did, what the angels were looking forward to was the time that Jesus took the serpent and put him under his feet. The word's very plain about this. And so we need to recognize that I am who he says I am. I am to have control in my own life. We always make the comment, we hear this always saying in, in a religious sect, actually, and it says that, hey, God's in control. Whatever will be, will be. Actually, the whatever will be, will be came from Doris Day, not from God. <laughs> there are very few in here remember Doris Day. <laughs> but it just, I'm proud of you girls. <laughs> But it's, there's things that we've got to recognize that, you know what, I don't want to live in the ignorance of mankind. But it's the ignorance of mankind that keeps picking Satan up and making him bigger than he really is. It's the ignorance of mankind that, that wants to listen to him. Listen to the deceptions and the lies. So, you know what? I actually think that all that is written right back there in the book of Genesis. In the very beginning of the word. And then it was nailed down at Calvary. We have rights to the advancement of the kingdom of God. Amen. Now, <clears throat> A power filled prayer life is something Jesus died to give you. This is part of my conviction in my own personal life. If I truly want to live a power filled prayer life, I must surrender my thoughts and attitudes unto the Father. I get to looking at the life of Jesus and through the word and the testimony of his prayer life. And, and you know what? Again, I believe he is the most perfect example of what a prayer life was supposed to be. And I am not finding in here where he did a lot of public prayer meetings. He didn't do it. He, didn't, he wasn't going around and holding all these big religious gatherings. He went to where people were gathered and ushered the kingdom. He spoke the kingdom. But in his prayer time, what was he doing? He was always going off to a solitude place. He was always getting alone. So I began to think about, well, what is this prayer? What does it really look like? And so 
I know that it's that a, a prayer filled life is to live a life of fullness. What Jesus died to give us. Okay? Full of what? Full of God's word, which is truth. It's truth that gives us the heart and the mind of Christ, which is transformation. And it empowers us to go forth, establishing the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. That's travel. So I believe that I heard from this truth, transformation, and travel within my life. And you know what? This, this is a simple, simple word, but it encouraged me greatly that I'm going to. I can be a little bolder in going forward if I spend enough time with my father. <clears throat> I can know that he's going to let me walk in victory. In fact, he promised in his word that he would lead me from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. And you know what? He doesn't have, uh, he, he has no lack in glory that he can't give to each and every one of us. He wants us to live in the victory of the resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, uh, Amen. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just testing you out. <laughs> that was mean, but it was good, though. It means I'm paying attention. Okay. <laughs> All right, there we go. So, Jesus gave himself totally to pray. I mean, you look, he was always going to pray. And when he had his disciples with him, he would say, wait here while I go and pray. And you know what? When Jesus would come back, yeah, there's times he fell on, found them asleep. And you know what? He might have had a amen. amen, hallelujah kind of deal going on. But he said, can you not sit with me for one hour? Can you not sit? And how many of you know that Jesus didn't pray for one hour at a time? He prayed for hours at a time. Mm -hmm. If I want to live a prayer-filled life, a powerful life, if I want to see, because every time Jesus would come back, he was always there and, and receiving from the Father the, the wisdom and the revelation that he needed. And when he walked back out into the world and the blind came to him, he said, Sue. When the lame came to him, he said, walk. When those affected with leprosy, he said, be clean. There wasn't a big, long prayer list. But it always took the blessings it received from the Father and imparted them into the hearts and the minds of the people he came into contact with. I think we've got some lessons to learn in this. I believe that we need to be better prepared because we're going to see the blind or the blind we're going to see the lame we're going to see those that are afflicted we're going to see those that are bound up in their relationships we're going to see those that are having issues financially in their life and we need to be prepared before we meet with them That's right, amen. Again, I want to say that there's some conviction in my life along this. Because if I want more, he said, ask me and I'll give you more. Be faithful with what I've entrusted to you and you will receive more. Seek the kingdom of God first and more is going to be added unto your life. He tells us how to do it. It goes on. So prayer is not a place of complaining. That, that can be a lesson in itself right there. But prayer is a place of seeking. Prayer is not, <laughs> do you remember Bewitched? Where you had the old jug and the genie the teapot looking deal, whatever it was. 
I dream a deed. That's what I dream. Yeah. It works the same way. I didn't remember the other one either, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, prayer life is not to be something, okay, and then God pops out and says, okay, you got three wishes. What do you want me to do for you? God's not your employer. God's not, many times we treat him like, as our employer. Said, you know what, God, man? I have been so faithful in my giving that you know what? You owe me. God, you know what? I've been so faithful in going to Bible study that you owe me. Y'all know people that have this kind of attitude? That they see God as someone that if you do, if I do all this stuff right, then God's going to do this for me. And so I want this, so God, I'm going to do this. That's not who he is. He's not a genie in a bottle. Or be witched either. <laughs> I'm going to go to Hebrews 11 again. I mean, Hebrews 12. Luke 12, that's what I'm going to say. Luke. Luke, Luke. Luke 11. This is starting out. This is Jesus again teaching on prayer. You know, that's one of the things. That's, well, I'll just start into it. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, now, this is Luke's account. <clears throat> Luke was a doctor. He was not one of the disciples. He was a doctor. And he was one that, that spoke life, spent a lot of time with him. And you know what? In his, uh, I don't know, it may be a little strange that you can, I don't know if y'all have ever seen the doctor's handwriting. It's hard to see sometimes. I'm glad Brent's not here right now. <laughs> Brent, if you're listening, I'm sorry. But many times we can recognize that, you know, Luke, he said here, and he's he pretty matter-of-fact in the way he says things. And so this is his, his account of what Jesus taught them to pray. And it says, Father, hallowed be your name. What's he saying? The very first thing there is, is if when you approach God in your prayer life, you need to approach him not as a God that's way off out there. You need to approach him as Father. You need to come from, because, hey, you became a child of God. That's right. He is your Father. I remember having some big conversations with some people when I first started teaching some of this about the fatherhood. And I, I have people say, how can you call God your Father? That's who he said he was. That's right. It's pretty plain. And so, in fact, the word says he's over there in Romans. He says the the Aramaic definition or of the word father is what? Abba. Abba, Abba, Father. <clears throat> he gave those his children the right to call him Father. How would be your name? Holy and set apart. If he's holy and set apart, that means that, hey, you're the only God in my life. I don't have a bunch of gods. And this is a big deal because there's a lot of people or a lot of things in this world that try to set themselves up as God that were created by mankind. You can read it through the word and it still goes on today. But it says, he is, you are my Lord, my Savior, I surrender my life to you. Mm -hmm. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Now we know back over Matthew's account that your, your kingdom come, your will be done. <clears throat> where? On earth as it is in heaven. This is God's desire. Mm -hmm. And it goes, and, and through this, through Luke's account here, he just he just simply says, your kingdom come. Mm -hmm. 
In other words, your dominion, authority, and rulership come right here and let it take root and begin to spread out so that it can be advancing in this world through you. That's God's desire for you in your life, that his dominion would rule through your life. It goes on and says, give us each day our daily bread. Give us each day our daily bread. In John chapter 4, Jesus' words were, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Guess what our food needs to be? Our food needs to be doing the will of God in our life. This is the race he's marked out for you in your life. It goes, <clears throat> goes on and says, uh, forgive us our sins. Forgive us where we miss the mark. Now again, has there been anybody in here since you got saved that you've missed the mark? Yeah. We all have. But guess what? He's a God of forgiveness. That's right. Amen. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. And it says that you were saved by grace through faith in him. In other words, because of the divine influence that comes from him and settles upon you, takes root within your heart, it will actually become a reflection thereof in your life. And you know what? You won't miss the mark as much as you used to. Because you are a work in progress. We have not arrived. Amen. We are still walking out our salvation. The word goes on and says, forgive us or it said, for we also forgive everyone who misses the mark against us. Is this true? You forgive everyone? God called us to. And so I need to recognize that within my own life. I need to recognize that if I'm holding bitterness towards somebody, I need a transformation within my life. Yeah. I need the truth, the transformation, and then I need to move forward. Mm -hmm. Travel. So, lead us not into temptation. Hmm. You know what? I said back, and every time I read those scriptures, I think back about Jesus when he went to be baptized. And it says that the word actually, or that he was led after he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him, and he was led into the wilderness to be tempted. Guess what? I stand here today because of what Jesus did. He's already faced the temptations. Are they still going to try to come against us? Every time you want to pick that enemy up, yourself, and let him have roots within your life, you're going to be tempted. God's not going to lead you into that anymore. He's going to lead you through those things. Because they will come against you. There will be things that come against you that you could not see coming because you was distracted somewhere along the way. There's always going to be things within our life that we're going to have opportunities if we spend time in our prayer life the way he wanted that we can see the victory that we have in Jesus. Now, I need to keep moving here just a little bit. But it goes, suppose one of you, these are, again, Jesus' word on teachings of prayer. And it said, suppose one of you has a friend and he goes to him at midnight and says, and says friend, lend me three loaves of bread <clears throat> because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have nothing for him. Then the one inside, then the one inside, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are, are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I know that some of you still have young children 
Do you do your young children sleep with you? Have they slept with you? Maybe some of you. And you know what? If you get up, you don't want to wake them up in the middle of the night. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah. And I can see that in the heart of this guy here. He goes, hey, shh, y'all shut up out there. My kids are asleep. <clears throat> I think I've heard those words so far. But anyway, we go on and said, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because of this, because of he is a friend, yet because of his man's boldness, boldness is a key thing. Are you bold in your prayer life? Okay, let me. Because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. How did that guy know to go to his neighbor to get bread? I don't know exactly, but I just got the feeling I'm going, since they were neighbors, that, you know, he said, oh man, my friend just showed up. Here. Hey, I remember smelling my neighbor's wife was cooking bread today. I know that they're going to have some extra bread. And I want, and so he knew where to go. And that's important to recognize that. Because the word teaches us that we too are the aroma of Christ. People need to know where they can go and get help. Okay. Now this goes on and said, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Now again, he's teaching the prayer and teaching about kingdom prayer and going to our heavenly father and asking him for the things that you need and it says so I say to you ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and the door will be opened those are great scriptures to quote <coughs> but we're called to live not just quote them and it says for everyone who asks receives and, who, and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks, the door will be open. And what are you going to receive when you when God opens it? You're going to receive the promises of Christ Himself. What did He promise you? If you don't know, you need to seek it out. Seek it out. Get in the Word. Ask the Holy Spirit to be your teacher in it. And it says, "What <clears throat> said? Which of your fathers? Which of you fathers?" If, you, if your sons ask you for a fish, we'll give him a snake instead. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. Or if, he, or if you then, though you are evil, what does it mean you're evil? You were born in a sinful nature. And you have an opportunity that you may say yes to Jesus and still walk in a wrong nature. And that's not what God, we don't want that in our life. That's why we've got to know who he is, he says we are. And it says, know how to give good gifts to your children. And how much more will your Father in heaven give you, get it is, the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Amen. To give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. In John 16, verse 13. The word says, but when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you. This is huge. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. In other words, time spent in my prayer life, my intimate time with the Father, is always going to be the Holy Spirit guiding me in what's coming up. He's going to give me the wisdom and the revelation that I need to walk in dominion in that situation. Okay. Prayer is a very personal, transformational, encouraging habit that you need to have. Prayer prepares you for what is ahead. In John 14, 26. 
John 14, 26, it says, But the Counselor, the Spirit, or the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. You know what? The Holy Spirit is to be your teacher, not a preacher. You're not going to give an answer to me for what you believe. You're going to give an answer to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's why I have to always and always will tell you that the Holy Spirit is your teacher. Surrender your life to Him. And allow Him to guide you and to teach you. And I want to give you this final scripture. Maybe. <laughs> Just so you girls know, sometimes when I say this is the final scripture, we've got about 30 minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Always. <laughs> sometimes. Verse 15, or chapter 15, verse 16, it says, you did not choose me. These are the words of Jesus. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. To go and to bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then, your, then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. He said, that's up for victory. This is my command, love each other. Love each other. You know, I know that there's so much of this word that uh, when you get to studying things like prayer, there's no end to it. I mean, when you really begin to look, and I got, I, honestly, I got on my computer this weekend and I got to looking up things and pulling up things, and I actually have a little, uh, binder back there in the back that I have wrote up on prayers and prayer life before and intercessory prayers and the different types of prayers and and you know what and sometimes I get to look and I'm going sometimes my teaching in the past has just been religious hogwash because I tried to make it patterns and Jesus told us in one of about those scriptures I just shared, you don't be a vain repetition. The traditions of men make the word of God to no avail. So I need to be freshly hearing from the throne of God. That means that I can't be going back to my old teachings and keep teaching the same old thing for years and years and years because he is always speaking freshly to us. And you know what? If he's always advancing, he's always adding to it. He's always giving more wisdom and more revelation. So, okay, I told y'all I, I just had that one more scripture, didn't I? Okay. Well, this is probably, I really mean it. This is the last one. <laughs> and this is a scripture that I believe that it's just, it needs to come out. And it's, this is actually comes out of James chapter 1 and verse 4. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. You know what complete is? Full. Jesus died that you may have a life of fullness. And he says, come get it. In fact, he said in the book of Psalms, he said, he said, you know, he said, I have prepared, prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemy. He's, he's got all the provisions that we need for life and godliness on a table for us, but he says, scoot your chair up to the table. But don't just plant yourself there. Receive what you need to receive and prepare to go forward. And said, to be mature, complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask. 
He should ask God to give generously without finding fault. I love that. Because I had a lot of miss, missing the marks in my life. But they don't control me. They don't identify me. My identity comes through the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. It goes on and says, Without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown here and tossed by the winds. There's some tremendous scripture that says, By the winds of doctrines of man. You know what? Jesus came to introduce you to the God of all creation. He came to usher in God's thoughts, God's ideas, God's kingdom into your personal life so that it could overflow into the lives of those around you. And not just to the lives of those around you, but to the situation that you will face on this earth. So guess what? God is for you. He is not against you. Amen. He's not against you. We're playing now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's always my my prayer before we come in here is that you will hear from our Father's voice. That you don't hear just teaching or, or just a sermon, but you always will hear and encounter the Father's presence within your life. And those are areas that, yes, every Sunday we get together to pray before we start and speak some word here and there. But my conviction again is that I need to be spending more time intimately, as he said, in a solitude place to be better prepared. Because I believe that the Lord wants to wants to see the lame walk. I believe he wants to see the blind to see. I believe he wants people to totally be set free from the bondages of this world. Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. Then how's our prayer life? How's our prayer life? I'm thinking more stuff. I better move away. <laughs> Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for loving us the way that you do. Father, I know that if you promised us that, Father, that if we would come to you, spend time with you, get intimate with you, Father, that you would look into our lives, Father, and you would show us, Father, everything that we need for life and godliness. You would show us everything that we need to overcome the, the, the schemes of the enemy that come against us, whether it be just the ignorance or the selfishness of who I am. Father, you would reveal truth into my lives, into our lives, Father, if we would truly ask, seek, and knock. Yes, Lord. And if we don't hear an answer immediately, Father, I know that you said to ask, to see, and to knock, and then to ask, to see, and to knock, and to continue to live our life as a prayer. Always asking, always seeking. Because you said that if we would do that, Father, that we would be receiving. Mm. So, Father, there's things in my life that I stand in a way to receive. But, Father, I thank you for what you've entrusted to me to impart into the lives of others now. And so, Father, may we all always be seeking for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in every aspect of our life, in the aspects of our family's life, in the lives of those around us, our neighbors, and even the ones that we meet on the street. Father, you've given every one of us an oil cost, a circle of influence for your kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name.
there's something here that you need prayer about, I'm going to be right here to pray with you. I'd love to